Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. Ted Sides is the Managing Director of Hidden Brook Investments, LLC. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Hidden Brook Investments. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Hidden Brook Investments may maintain positions and securities or managers discussed on this podcast. My guest on today's show is Jeffrey Solomon, the president of Cowan Group, ticker C-O-W-N, a publicly listed financial services company that supports and provides active management to the marketplace. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in 1988, Jeff deferred an acting career with a brief respite on Wall Street, but he hasn't looked back since. In 1994, he joined Peter Cohen, then the former head of investment bank Shearson Lehman Brothers, to form money management firm Ramius Advisors. Ramius grew to become one of the largest hedge funds in the world, and in 2009, it merged with boutique investment bank Cowan Group. Following the merger, Jeff switched over to the investment banking side of the business and today serves as its CEO, where he embodies the firm's core values of vision, tenacity, and empathy. Our conversation starts with a passionate description of Pittsburgh sports and flows to how active managers succeeded in the 1990s and need to evolve to succeed today. We discuss the importance of empathy in the investment business and touch on how Jeff's summer camp experience as a kid informs how he manages people today. His answers to my closing questions are just amazing. If you're short on time, fast forward to the 45th minute of the show. You'll miss plenty along the way, but you won't want to miss these. Please enjoy my conversation with Jeff Solomon. Jeff, thanks for joining me. Good to be here, Ted. When I walked into your office for the first time, all I saw around the walls was paraphernalia from Pittsburgh sports teams. (laughs) Yeah. You're from Pittsburgh. My mom's from Pittsburgh. You went to the same high school. What is it about a passionate sports fan that comes out of Pittsburgh? So just to be clear, your mom went to high school with my parents. So for those listening, like I didn't go to (laughs) high school with your mother. Uh, But actually, no, my parents went to the same high school that my wife and I did. uh, And the same one that your mom did, Alderdice High School. Listen, Pittsburgh is an amazing town that is filled with so much energy. And uh, Pittsburghers have been down and out more times than we can mentioned, we always seem to come back. And uh, we do it because we work super hard at whatever it is that we do. And we feel like our sports teams are a, a huge representative of who we are as people. So, you know, talk to me or talk to anybody who grew up in Pittsburgh, especially in the 70s when the Steelers were in their, their heyday the first time. And it is a resilient bunch of folks who uh, totally identify their personas with the sports teams. And I, by the way, I love how the sports teams in Pittsburgh root for each other. So, you know, I was at a Penguins game last year during the Stanley Cup final, and I ran into like three or four Steelers there. You know, and old Steelers like Franco Harris and new Steelers like Ryan Shazier and Antonio Brown and Cam Hayward. And they're fans of each other and they root for each other. The Penguins actually had a game scheduled during a Steeler playoff game earlier this year, regular season game, and they moved the game back three hours and open up the stadium for all Penguins season ticket holders to come watch the Steelers play, you know, at PPG Arena. And they moved the game because they knew that the rest of the city is like really preoccupied with the Steelers in the playoffs. And why do that to them? And it's just, you know, that is like amazing interaction from professional sports athletes who feel an affinity for the community in which they live. And so I've always, I don't want to make more of it than it is, but I believe that, it, you know, sports teams can represent the ethos of a community. And to me, the Steelers, the Penguins, and even the Pirates, when they've had some challenging times, right? 20 losing seasons. They represent the hardworking ethos of the people of Pittsburgh, 
who, by the way, many of whom, like me, do not live in Pittsburgh anymore. Right. So we grew up there, and we, there's this giant Pittsburgh diaspora, because the city went from you know, several million people to like 400,000. And yet we maintain that passion. We raise our children to be Pittsburgh sports fans, and it is a great bonding experience for all kinds of people, regardless of, regardless of ethnicity or religion. If you're from Pittsburgh, you've got a lot to talk about. So how does a, a, a Pittsburgh boy find his way to Wall Street. Yeah, I came here to be an actor. Uh, actually, I did. Really? Uh, I did, yeah. I was at the University of Pennsylvania. Did a lot of theater as an undergrad. And I really wanted to come to New York with a lot of my friends who were going to be working on Broadway. I decided, though, that the acting thing was sort of risky. Wasn't sure that I would exactly be able to make it. And I thought I needed a critical skill in case it didn't all work out. So I got a job on Wall Street just for two years, make a little bit of money, put it away. So that if the acting thing didn't, didn't really work out for me, I'd A, have money and B, I'd have skill. I did it. I actually worked on Wall Street for two years as an investment banking analyst at Shearson Lehman. And after I was done, I, I quit to work to go to work acting. I was pitching Peter Cohen an investment idea. And Peter Cohen at the time had just left Shearson and was trying to figure out the next chapter of his life. And in the middle of the pitch, he asked me, what are you doing with yourself? And I'm like, well, I'm leaving and I'm going to be an actor. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I mean, uh, that's my life plan at the age of 24. And he said, well, why don't you, like, can you do the acting thing and come work for me and help me look at deals and opportunities and ideas? And I'm like, uh, I guess, can I go on auditions whenever I want? And he's like, yeah. And so out of that actually became the foundation of a, an amazing partnership. You know, Peter Cohen and I have been working together for 28 years through ups, downs, and sideways. As I've told people, he's enabled me to never change firms. I've changed the firm. That's a really interesting thing. And I look back on the last 30 years of my career, I'm like, wow, I actually never quit anywhere. I got to the end of my program at Shearson and I went to work for Peter. The acting thing I decided just wasn't to my, I, I didn't want to be a professional actor. It turned out that I just didn't like it that much. And what I was doing with Peter was really exciting, building businesses. And so uh, that became really my career and the partnership has been fantastic. So it started as an investment partnership. And after some years, you were managing a hedge fund. Right. Multi-strategy hedge fund. Yeah. What were the basic tenets of investing that Peter brought that you took on? It was interesting. I, I got to do something at Shearson that was pretty unique in retrospect. I didn't know at the time. We were uh, going to do a public offering at Shearson. We were already public, but we were going to raise more capital in 1990. And so I got to actually draft the S1 for the follow-on offering and raise additional capital. And in the, in the course of doing that, I got to see all these different businesses that Shearson was in because I drafted the S1. I would literally walk around from department to department and write down like, what is, what is private placements mean? What are convertible bonds? What is an equities trader do? And what do volumes mean? And what I learned is that there were all these little businesses that we had inside Shearson that made a lot of money. They were unique, like merger arbitrage and event business, like uh, securities lending business, like all these things that are like really interesting businesses that were really the purview of Wall Street at that time. And what we've been able to do at Ramius when we started that in 94 is essentially take a number of those businesses that were really profitable inside investment banks of the 80s and do them for investors. And if you think about the way the hedge fund business evolved, it evolved from people who were on the prop desks, you know, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, you know, all these different places in the 80s. And they spun out and started their own firms, largely managing money for the partners of those firms. And we sort of took a different tack and we said, listen, we know how we made all this money at Shearson and all these strategies. Can we import those people to come and build those businesses for investors that Peter had relationships with? And that was really the genesis for starting Ramius in 1994. Uh, was to build out a business that was basically enabling investors, high net worth investors, to access strategies that heretofore had been only the purview of investment banks. And when you started to, in 1994, Peter's this great luminary coming off the street. What, what did a big fund look like? How much money would a big fund manage oh, back then? $100 million? Yeah. We, you know, we thought if we could get to the $100 million, bucks, that would be great. It was. I mean, we, we got to our first hundred probably within a few years. It's a few years to a hundred million. Yeah. A little different from the scale that people expect today. Yeah. Although I think it's much more harder for people to launch funds today than it, than it was, you know, in the, in the salad days. But yeah, no, a hundred million dollars we thought was a lot. We could cover all of our overhead with the management fee. We were almost always a one in 20 shop for the most part. 
And then we added a fund of funds capability when Tom Strauss joined and Morgan Stark joined. We added a, a fund of funds capability. And when was that? That was in 95, okay. right? You know, right almost right yeah. afterwards. So what, what you know, Ramius, uh, now Callan Investment Management is, uh, or, or was at that point, was simply on its way to being a multi-strategy and a multi-manager shop that then would seed strategies and grow them. And the difference between us and a number of other firms is we actually raised money for the GP from friends and family and strategic investors so that we could further incubate strategies with our own capital base, yeah. which is something we still do today at Cowan. And so you, that business grew things pretty much in a steady state, right? Until the financial crisis. Well, I'd say, you know, up until 98. 98 was a tough time. It was the first time I really got to see how correlation worked in real life. I, we talked about it you know, mathematically, how uh, in times of stress things correlate, but I'd never seen parts of our portfolio that had n- nothing to do with the Thai bot, you know, almost converge in terms of their performance. And fortunately for us, we, we've never really been a big user of leverage. So we definitely lived through periods of stress and pricing, but we've we recognize that as long as you're not leveraged and forced out of the trade at an inopportune time, you can last a long time. So a lot of our strategies are still very much alive and well. They may be smaller, they may be larger, but they're still here. And in large part, because we're just conservative with the way we think about that. You know, today, everyone talks about behavioral finance, and it's well understood. In 98, you experienced it, but you probably didn't have the term to say, oh, I must be suffering from risk aversion or whatever it was. How did, <laughs> how did it feel going through it where things are just wacky? You'd never seen it before. Merger deals are breaking because the Thai bot's doing whatever. You probably didn't know in the moment that long-term capital Well, had so we, we actually had some insight around you long-term did. capital because of Tom Strauss and his relationship with John Merriweather. So all of those guys worked for Tom. So we had a pretty good idea of what was going on there. I I don't think we fully appreciated the knock-on effect. This is really the precursor to too big to fail. I mean, all the firms had to get around the table and figure out how to work out a very large, highly levered, quant-oriented fund. Sound familiar? I mean, it's, you know, the older I get, the more I see things through a similar lens. It's just sometimes bigger. It's always a little bit different, but many of the, the themes there were the same. I just didn't fully appreciate the contagion risk. And that's really, when I look at behavioral investment, I think about individuals, generally speaking, know what they know and they see what they see. And the hardest thing to do as a manager is to have peripheral vision and understand how something at the periphery might impact something in the middle of your vision. In that particular situation, with spreads widening and merger arbitrage deals, it wasn't that the deals themselves got riskier per se, which is what it would tell you if spreads were widening, but it was that you had a distressed seller in there. And then other people who owned that position had to mark it down. And if they were levered, then they had to start liquidating positions. And you ended up with a situation where it exacerbates. And that's really the, the, the contagion issue is probably more impactful in times of stress than people give it credit for. Now, that's, and that's look, the same story in 2008. It was a giant contagion trade. So what, what happened to the business then between, say, 98 and the next 2008, 2008 and those 10 years? So it grew like tremendously. So I, I think from 98 uh, after that um, until 2000, we actually had a tough time raising money, not because of our performance, but because if you remember 98 to 2000, everybody was getting long internet stocks and tech, the tech bubble. So people thought it was their God-given right to achieve sort of 25 or 30% returns on their equity investments. We're like trying to tell them 500 over the risk-free rate is over the long haul is better than the, the long-term return on equities with a volatility that's a fraction of equities, right? If the S&P vol was 14, we were like, hey, we're two, a two vol. Monthly, standard deviation, pretty high bar, actually. And at the time, we actually had interest rates uh, or short-term rates close, you know, not near zero. And so, you know, you're talking about high single-digit returns to actually low double-digit returns in around 10%, which seems pretty good. It just was hard to convince people that they should not invest in, you know, portfolios of internet stocks. And so uh, we didn't really raise a lot of money until things broke. We actually took some money in from Bank Austria as a strategic investor and sold 25% of the firm to them. And they gave us a bunch of money to manage in that conservative style. And then by the middle to the end of 2000, people are like, okay, okay, okay. I need to actually focus on long-term wealth creation through consistent returns. Boom. Let's talk to Ramius. You know, it sounds a little bit like the active-passive debate today. You have an S&P 500 that's had a big run. Hedge funds, for sure, haven't really delivered what investors may have expected, 
But there is this dynamic that they're not supposed to keep up with a roaring bull market, certainly since 2009. Yeah, I know you guys have done some work on it. How do you think about where we stand in active and passive, and, and what's your view? Well, I think it's changed investing. So, you know, if you were an investor in the 90s or the 2000s or the 80s, like the strategies that you pursued in order to achieve alpha, you know, may not be working the way that they were working before we had a significant portion of the market in passive product. So we're, we're getting to the point now where passive product is so dominant that you have to begin to try to figure out how to model in the presence of significant passive players. Now, up until now, it's been a relatively low vol environment, you know, because money has been coming in and coming in pretty consistently. And, you know, if people are buying index product. That means everything in the index goes up. If I know anything about math, I know if you can have 10 vol, you could have 30 vol or 40 vol. You know, it's just sort of every day you spend at 10, you should be really thinking in your own head and in normal distribution curve, you could really have a tail at the other end. And that will likely happen when all of the individuals make a decision to take risk off the table. And they can do it, I mean, really easily today. It's a click of a button or you, you know, touch your iPad and you liquidate your ETF in the middle of the day. And we will see index vol a spike at some point in my life, I'm 100% sure. And when it does, we don't quite yet know how, that, how far that will go because we just don't know how deep people are going to de-risk. And when they do, they're going to sell everything. And so, you know, we were just talking about contagion in 98. Mm. If you take that lens, have you tried to think about it's the same dynamic if and when presumably that time comes and people are selling everything? What, how do you position? What do you do? So I think there's, you need to carry more cash as an active manager. I just, you're going to definitely un, underperform in, in upward bull markets. But if investors are smart about this, what they'll do is they'll recognize that over a cycle, there's going to be an opportunity for you to buy things at distressed prices or at stressed prices. I do believe active management is not going away. It's going to be smaller as a percentage of the overall market, though, active management today, there's more assets in active management today than ever has been. So right, sure. it's not that active management has gotten smaller, it's just gotten smaller as a percentage of the overall market. So there'll be a lot of money that gets made by patient capital. People who are sitting on cash will have their day uh, and they will get an opportunity to, to, uh, to pick and choose the time when they want to enter the market. And there you're going to get a significant amount of market uh, under, uh, outperformance. I'll also say this, Someone had showed me a stat, which I'll, I'll see if I can find for you, but I think you'll find this interesting because it would have been relevant to you in your bet with Mr. Buffett. It's all well and good to say I have, I'm picking a starting point and an ending point on an investment, a decade. Nobody does that because life gets in the way or emotions get in the way. Like, I don't think I have anything in my portfolio today that I had in my portfolio 10 years ago, really. And if I do, it's... I don't know. I've forgotten about it, right? And very few investors really do, it turns out. So even though we've had this great move in indices, if you actually look at funds flows into ETFs, people are still doing the same thing they were always doing, which is crowding in at peaks and selling at valleys. And so when you look at it, if you just do a, a, an adjustment for the performance in passive product, just take the S&P and look at when people entered and exited as a proxy, or look at volumes as a pr proxy for when people entered and exited, they actually haven't gotten the returns. They've, sub, they've, under, they've underperformed active managers tremendously. Yeah. In fact, Michael Mobison just did a piece where he showed that they measured effectively the difference between time-weighted and dollar-weighted returns. So they measured, I think he called it the behavioral cost or something like that. And it was higher than the fee difference between active manager by a factor of two. No it was question. something like 120, 140 basis points a year that investors cause themselves friction in the same index just by going in and out the wrong times. So I think if that's going to come home to roost. I mean, just, just like hedge funds were the rage and then people said, hey, I think I'm overpaying for beta here and uh, I think I can get that cheaper. Or just like mutual funds with a rage, actively managed, and then people are like, hey, I'm overpaying for beta. Look, people have crowded into a really cheap alternative. And it, look, it makes a lot of sense. The, the siren of passive investing is, I mean, every time you go to your financial advisor, don't they pull out that really wonderful chart that shows you the efficient frontier and how to allocate your money and then go back to your daily life? It's what everybody wants, except it really doesn't work long term if you 
uh, because life gets in the way. You've got to sell because, I don't know, you had a life event or you need the cash or whatever happens. Things, life gets in the way. Active managers, though, are changing the way that they're going about the business. And I don't think what what we know to be active management today is going to look, or tomorrow, is going to look anything like it looked in the 80s and 90s. Say more about that. Well, the clients I'm talking to are really changing their, at least let's talk about equities, which is the one I probably know best. More concentrated positions, higher conviction trade names. Longer time horizons as well. Longer time horizons. But if you're a long only manager and you're closet indexing, you're going to get killed. You know, just you can't you can't possibly justify your fee structure. So a number of players are, are like taking up their positions from a hundred to like forty, and just owning the ones and being right and recognizing that that's actually what you're getting paid to do. You're getting paid to pick stocks. You're not getting paid to aggregate assets. Yeah. And listen, it's a you know, there's a several hundred trillion dollars in active manager, whatever it is. It's like a huge number. I mean, Fidelity alone has two trillion in actively managed product. It's going to take a while for that to take hold. But I, I think from our standpoint at Cowan, when we think about how we're catering to the active manager, we have to have high conviction names. We have to have high conviction themes that have multiple names, that you, ways to play a theme. And that's the way we're catering to, to the changing face of active management. So I want to circle back. We, we left a sort of a decade gap out. And we certainly don't need to fill in 98 to 2008. But at one point in time, the Ramius business, which was a private investment partnership, merged into Cowan. And as a public company, you're executive of the public company. Talk a little bit about the differences and how do you approach thinking about either allocating capital, managing a business when you are running a public company as opposed to when you just had a private investment partnership? So there are actually many similarities, actually a tremendous number of similarities and a few differences. But I'll start by saying this, you know, we were just talking about active and passive. So I believe that's dominating the entire investment landscape. So wherever you live in the investment landscape, if you're not discussing this and figuring out how you're going to engage with the active passive battle, you're just, everything else you're doing is a derivative of that debate in my opinion. So at Cowan, we made a decision that we're only going to cater to active management. Well, so at Cowan Investment Management, we sell alpha generating capabilities directly to the end buyer. And at Cowan and Company, we're selling alpha to the alpha provider to the end buyer. Same thing. When I think about my portfolio skills, I learned in managing the multi-strategy fund at Ramius, which I did with Morgan Stark for, you know, the better part of a decade. I thought about how to manufacture alpha in the various strategies that we had and the various positions that underlie those strategies. Same thing. I'm thinking about how we're allocating the firm's time and energy and money to achieve a goal of penetrating marketplaces. So instead of you know, thinking about investment returns per se, I'm thinking about whether or not we can make an impact enough in a market share that will drive revenues, that will ultimately drive ROE at the firm. And it's a much longer period of time. So when I was running our multi-strategy firm, I was trying to scratch out monthly returns, which I think is really almost impossible, but it was, we did it for like a decade, which is, I think, not sustainable, it turns out. We've returned all the money in our multi-strategy fund because living up to that ideal was impossible at the end. When I think about the investments we're making at Cowan, we've been at this for seven years, and we're now finally beginning to reach the size and scale where the investments that we're making can drive profitability long term. Seven years. Seven years. I think that's a very long period of time. Uh, But if we had sub-optimized or optimized for trying to do quarterly returns at various times, we would have missed opportunities to make meaningful investments in businesses that are going to be long-term sustainable for us. So it's, just, it's a different time frame, and uh, but it's this really it's the same allocation uh, methodology. You also hear commonly that public companies have quarterly pressure for earnings, and is that real? I mean, do you feel that, or it sounds like it's more like a hey Warren Buffett model? You know, we're going to make long term investments. We're going to pay any attention to the quarters. Yes, I think if you're public, you have to play a little bit more to quarterly and short-term investing. I I, I do because there's expectations built in. And think about it. Like I always think about like who's the stakeholders, the owners, the share. So who are they? Largely active managers. What do active managers need? They need performance and they need it soon. 
So that begets shorter term thinking. They, they have daily liquidity funds, most of them. They need performance or people are just going to redeem and move into uh, the passive product. So I think we have to, you have to create balance and, and set expectations. It's okay to take a profitable business and, and, and invest a portion of your profits to a longer term growth objective. But you probably need to be a little bit more transparent about the fact that you're doing that. So last year we lost money at Cowan. And we told our investors very clearly, this is the amount of money we spent on people and infrastructure that added no revenue this year. Because we expect that over the next two years, we're going to get multiples of that back in M&A fees, in increased commissions, because we saw opportunities in a trough year last year to make investments that we think are going to be long-term sustainable. That's a very transparent statement that you have to make to the market. I still think our investors would like us to eke out quarterly performance numbers in terms of ROE. They would prefer that it happens sooner rather than later. It's going to happen, and it will happen as the markets in which we've invested evolve the way we think they will. Talk a little bit about management of a firm. Uh, you know, the money management business is not notoriously gifted for being good people managers, as many other businesses are in comparison, as money managers. How, how do you think about managing people? You know, I, I, uh, I've been a student of this. I still am a student of it. I think that generally speaking, Wall Street firms have not done a great job at managing people, with some exception. But if you look at the history of Wall Street firms, you know, the, the tendency is to promote producers into management positions. And there's a very big disconnect between great producers and great managers. Turns out management is a somewhat different skill set. I think the number one thing you need to think about as a manager is empathy. I do. Empathy. Empathy. Empathy is not a word <laughs> you commonly hear in Wall Street circles. Well, it's, it's one of our three characteristics we, we admire most in our Cowan employees. Vision. How is it what you're doing uh, make, can make an impact internally or externally? Tenacity. Can you go out and get it, make it happen, or are you sort of waiting? Like, you have to be tenacious in this business, but you have to be empathetic. And the reason is because you need to understand what motivates the person you're trying to engage with. You don't have to agree with it. You just need to understand it. And the best way to understand how somebody thinks or what motivates them is to try and imagine what it's like to be them. That's empathy, right? I, I want to know what are the things you care most about? Why are you doing what you're doing? Just explain that to me. And when you ask questions like that from clients, a lot of times you'll hear answers that you would agree with you know, I really want to provide for my kids. Or, you know, I really think we can change the world if we develop this pharmaceutical drug and there is this orphan drug for this community of individuals who have no hope. I want to be at the forefront of drug discovery there. Yes, I'm going to make money doing it. But I came to this industry because I want to help. And I feel like in, you know, in our business on Wall Street, we should be asking that all the time from others. So my engagements as a former buy sider with Wall Street firms were not so great. I had to deal with them, with the firms on Wall Street as opposed to wanted to deal with them. And yet there were always a handful of individuals who I felt actually got me at a much more visceral level. And I wanted to do business with them. It didn't matter what card they carried necessarily, right? It mattered that I trusted them and that their firms could deliver for them when I needed them to. So that's really the secret to doing this in my mind. Managing is all about saying, I feel you and I think I can be helpful. And by the way, you know, there's an economic trade in there too. There's an economic element to that, but it's secondary to, can I move the needle for you? And can we move the needle for each other? Can I lend my brand to enhance your opportunity set? Can we affiliate with one another to get, be in a better spot than we were? That is all empathy at work. And I just think it's, a, it's one of the most core human characteristics. It's what's part of what makes us different from the rest of the animal kingdom. And nobody talks about it, especially in this day and age. Yeah. So I imagine that filters through everything at the firm. Your, your hiring process, are the types of people that work at Cowan a little of a different breed than the common maligned Wall Street employee? You know, I'd like to think so. I mean, everyone <laughs> wants, but that's part of it. Like everyone wants to think they're special. And I believe the people who work at Cowan are special. I do. I also think they're individuals, though. So let's be really clear. Empathy does not, is not a substitute 
it does not mean that you have to be giving up your individualism for the sake of the whole. Actually, let's acknowledge the fact out of the gate that everybody who comes to Wall Street has an entrepreneurial spirit. So I'm willing to listen to what other people have to say, because I believe at the end of the day, provided that they're on the same rationality spectrum as I am, that the teammates we have at Cowan are giving me advice based on what will make them better. Could be more selfish or less selfish, but let's face it, they want Cowan to help them be better here than anywhere else. That's actually my job. And I don't dis- discount the fact that they're individuals and they want to succeed on their own. I just want to be the enabler of that. And if they value the enablement, if they value the way that we permission them with tools and products and services and relationships, well, then they can be better here than anywhere else. But they're still individuals who want to win desperately. And that is the essence of teamwork. And to me, like, that's sort of how you embrace this notion of empathy in, in the context of having a, an industry that inherently gets people who might be more selfish. Because anybody who's long-term successful and long-term greedy knows that it takes a village. That's the kind of people I think we're looking for. Yeah, you know, one of the things that often doesn't get talked about, and certainly in the public media in the hedge fund space is the great work that people who have made money have done for others. I know you've been involved in a couple of pretty interesting organizations, nonprofits. Why don't you tell a story of how you got involved in each and where that goes? Well, look, I, I think everybody has their own philanthropic journey. I feel extremely fortunate. And I have more money than I thought I would have. I never really thought about how much money I would have, but I, I kind of feel pretty good. I still have to work. Right. I'm, I'm still I'm not ready to be done working. But there's an element of that that I feel fortunate enough that I can help others who have less than me. And it's really interesting, the psychic joy you get from doing that. I, I never really focused on it. I used to feel bad that I couldn't do more. And that feeling bad that I couldn't do more overwhelmed the joy I got from doing something. So what I would say is you don't have to be the CEO of a firm to make an impact. Actually, I wish if I, if I have a few regrets, but one of the ones is I wish I had, go, had realized that earlier, that the little bit that I could have done was just good. I was doing what I could do as opposed to feeling bad about not being able to do more. My involvement with UJ Federation actually in particular was late. I, was, I didn't really come to it until I was 40 years old. And part of that is because my experience with UJ Federation in Pittsburgh or, or United Jewish Federation of Pittsburgh was one where they always asked my parents to give money that we didn't have. And we felt bad at the dinner table that we couldn't do more. And uh, so I was really 40 years old before I realized the value of giving to philanthropy. UGA Federation does a ton here in New York. It was sort of one of the number one uh, supporters uh, during the AIDS crisis in the 80s and 90s. Certainly one of the, the biggest supporters of Hurricane Sandy victims more recently. It does a lot to invest in social services here in New York City, which is my community now. And it does a lot for Jews worldwide who don't have the things they need to have, and it ensures Jewish continuity, and those are things that are important to me. But more importantly, what it gives back to me is I know I'm making a difference in the lives of others, and they make it easy for me. And if I look back in my history, and I think all Americans can look back on this. It's not just you know the Jewish story. It's the American story in large part. All of us, if you look back in our history, personal histories, Somebody came from somewhere that wasn't so good. They made a really bold decision to leave, leave family, leave friends, leave everything sometimes, and jump into a, a, usually a ship or a plane or a whatever and come to a place where they didn't know anybody. They, had, they came for the ideal. And they came for future generations. They came because they knew that if they worked really hard, the next generation and the generation after that would be successful. What is often forgotten is most of those people who made brave decisions had others help them. In my case, there was a man who was a very wealthy French Jew who was helping to relocate Jews in Eastern Europe to Canada, which is where my great-grandfather came. Without him, like my great-grandfather could have wanted to go any one of a number of places, but he didn't have the means. So for me, philanthropy is about giving back in that spirit. 
I don't know everybody I'm helping, but if I help a life or two somewhere, they're going to go on and do amazing things for others in the future. That's, I mean, what more can you ask for? And that's my philanthropic mission. You have another affiliation that I know came from a different experience, which involves summer camps. Yeah. We are turning the season. Kids are starting to think about what they're doing for the summer. And I know there's a tie from a you know conversation we've had about your experience in summer camps and both how it's affected your life and how it's affected how you think about business and managing people and the kind of situations that that you thrive in. Yeah, I'm going to write a book someday. I think I told you I'm going to write a book that's called Everything I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Summer Camp. It's true. You know, I think back to my earliest days, I, I've learned a whole bunch about myself uh, that in retrospect makes a ton of sense. I have difficulty with transition, it turns out. I mean, a lot of people do, but I really, I cried when I went to summer camp and I cried when I came home from summer camp. I didn't want to leave home because I was having fun there and I cried for the first two days and then I was having a time in my life and then when camp was over, I cried because I didn't want to go home. And I learned that about me. So when I have like transitions in life and in business, I already know what that feeling is. I learned that feeling when I went away to summer camp the first time. And I, I could recognize that in myself and say, hey, Jeff, it's going to be just fine. You know, you have difficulty with transition and so, and change. And so I'd say at a very basic level, summer camp, made me learn how to deal with change. And my biggest way to deal with change is be the agent of change. You should be encouraging change and evolution before change gets you. Turns out change isn't so bad if you're the one doing it. Yeah, sure. And I feel like part of my coping mechanism that I learned at summer camp and in other places, but first at summer camp is how can I evolve so that things don't, change doesn't get foisted on me before I'm, and then I have to react because that makes me feel really uncomfortable. I also think that summer camp is where you learn leadership skills. You learn how to fit in with a group, how to play with a group, how people you like and people you don't like. And you inherently get a sense for like where you want to affiliate and associate when you get to make choices. You know, at summer camp, you end up in a cabin with a bunch of people and you got to make it work. And it's all day, every day, 24 hours a day. And that sometimes can be super hard, but you got to make it work because you don't have a choice. You know, when things get tough here, which sometimes they do, you know, we have disagreements and we have people that are at each other from time to time. You can sit down and say, hey, 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 are we on the same team and what are we trying to get accomplished here? And why are we arguing? Like, let's talk about why we're actually arguing. Because if we're arguing because we have different ideas on how to get to a common goal, let's focus on the common goal. Because we, we all have something here we want to get accomplished. Let's establish the baseline for what we're trying to get accomplished. Some days at summer camp, it's just getting to the end of the day. I just want to be able to get to the end of the day and have fun. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to do that and how we're going to navigate that. Those are, those are basic skills, I think, that are at the center of human interaction in groups. And you learn that at places like summer camp. I want to turn a little bit back to investing, and let's just talk about what you're seeing in the market, some of the, the opportunities and risks. Where, where are you most excited about where are you seeing opportunities? That's a great question. So I, you know, I think that there are some really amazing opportunities to do things in some non-correlated assets. I, I, I'm not exactly sure how scalable they are, but I, I think there's going to be some great opportunities to play, to take advantage of the lack of volatility in the marketplace. I think it, it, there's some innovative ways that we're working on to quantitatively take advantage of getting long volatility at the right times. Those are, I know they sound like the holy grail, but if we can get them to work right, I think they'll be really scalable and they're more quantitative in nature. I get really super excited about anything that's data-driven in terms of investment. I think computer-assisted and data-driven assisted investing is the best. I, I'm, I'm skeptical about quant investing just because I've had a few instances in which the model stopped working and people spend a lot of time trying to figure out what happened. So I'm much more interested in how do we develop um, data analytics that, that enable fundamental investors to make more well-informed decisions. And so I think there's going to be some great opportunities in, in that area. In equities, I think we're going to invariably have a, I, I'm sitting, we're sitting on a lot of cash being defensive because I think you're going to get a chance to buy some stuff cheap. And if it turns out we're wrong, we're still going to be okay. I, I think that's a great power position to be in. If we underperform a little bit on the upside, you never get fired for doing that. And, and so that's kind of what we're, what we're thinking about. We're going to be launching some 
some new products here, so probably shouldn't talk about them too much. <laughs> <laughs> and how about risks? I mean, people see them everywhere. They turn in the market today, but what are the what are the big things you're looking, keeping your eye on? I, I just think I, I want to see what happens when ETFs, by the way, are the thing that just, you know, I, so like there's known knowns and known unknowns, right? We know that there's going to be a market correction. We don't know how it's going to happen. We can surmise. ETFs are just structured products. There's a couple of things I, I just have noticed in my career. It seems to me that structure always, structure and leverage, and the combination of structure and leverage always ends up in a bad place. CDS was the fastest growing credit default swaps, the fastest growing tradable instrument in the history of mankind. It went from nowhere in 2003 to everywhere in 2008, trillions and trillions of dollars of it. CDS, there's nothing inherently wrong with CDS, right? It's an interesting way for two individuals to take a bet on a credit that's you know offline or not in the non-cash markets. It's just, we had too much of it and no one could keep, can, can keep control of it. And so when it, when it went the other way, there was massive amounts of losses, right? An inverted pyramid, we've all heard about it. To me, we don't know what will happen when ETFs, if ETFs find massive outflows. There are, in many ETFs, significant mismatches between the liquidity that the ETF promises and the underlying liquidity of the instruments. And in times of stress, if I know anything, liquidity gets worse. So we've been in the most low volatility environment in my time ever investing, and liquidity in the underlying markets has also never been worse across all asset classes. So just to repeat that, usually in up markets, We've seen great liquidity. You can sell anything in an up market. You can buy anything in an up market. Those are the, the hallmarks, the health of the plumbing of how uh, people generate returns. And yet, if you talk to the, the traders who trade equities or trade fixed income or really any instrument, liquidity has never been worse. So we've had great upside moves and terrible liquidity. Well, here's one thing I'm pretty sure of. In the next down move, liquidity is not going to improve. So if we look out, you know, let's say independent of these major market moves, if we look out 10 years, so many of the functions we're talking about were core Wall Street functions, providing liquidity to the markets and the trading side. What does Wall Street look like? I mean, there's a lot of questions about regulation, the current administration, but what, what do you think Wall Street might look like 10 years from now? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to punt on that question, but I think about where, where I was personally 10 years ago, and I could have never imagined this. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I really, I mean, I, I was, it would have been 2007 and things were looking pretty darn good in May of 2007. I thought I was the king of the world and I, everything I touched turned to gold. I had a great year in the first month of 2007. That's like a, that, that was, should have been a warning signal to me in retrospect. I, there's nothing in my portfolio that would have suggested I would have ever outperformed the way we outperformed in the first quarter. I never took the time to say, oh my, I should really think about de-risking because I've made the entire year this quarter. I'm like, no, it's a paradigm shift. I had all these rationales for, I backed into a rationale in explaining our performance in the first quarter of 2007. I would just say, I, I, all, the only thing I know is that it's going to be different. 10 years is an eternity. It's like a, it's a generation and a half on Wall Street. You know, we still haven't, this generation of capital committers, the 30-somethings, the last time we had 5% short-term rates, they might have been in diapers. We're in a very different spot. And so I can't imagine, you know, what risk-taking is going to look like in 10 years. There's a few things that I will say. One, active management isn't going away. So I think there will always be, be a portion of the market that wants to outperform and is willing to pay for the option around outperformance. So I think that's going to still be here. I think if you're not doing data analytics and you're not doing things to make yourself, um, uh, enable yourself to see more than you can see as a human by just analyzing pools of data to make better investment decisions, you're going to get left in the past. And I'll just say this, trust never goes out of style. Someone said that to me. I'm like, you know what? You're right. You know what? I, I do business with people I inherently think have my back and I'm willing to pay them more than I probably should. But trust is a real value and a real commodity that you cannot replace by a machine or anything else. And so whatever we're going to be doing at Cowan in 10 years or however the markets shape up, our goal is to ensure that we do not squander the trust we've built for the people we serve. 
I know that sounds really like ideal, but you would be surprised when you have opportunities to make money and it might squander the trust if you make the right decision in the moment and recognize that that's the thing you need to preserve because that's your, that is your franchise. Well, long term, you can build some serious wealth and that's, I think, what we'll be trying to do. Jeff, let's turn to some of my customary closing questions. Uh, I want to start with what is your favorite thing to do that is a complete waste of time? <laughs> wow. A complete waste of time? Sure. Yeah, I'd have to really think about that. I, I like to, I, you know, I, I like to sit out back and smoke a cigar. I don't think it's a waste of time. So it's hard for, I got to think about this though. I, I, there, I love to take uh, downtime. You and I have talked about this. I, so I used to think that was a waste of time. If I'm not doing something, I'm wasting time. And the reality is like watching a TV show and vegging, there's something really relaxing about that. Sitting out back and smoking a cigar and thinking 40-year-old me would be like, why are you wasting time? There's tons of stuff to do. And the 50-year-old, one-year-old me is like, wow, I can't wait to do that because I have so many things I want to think about with the business, with my life, with my kids, with my wife. And I treasure that. So I, I, don't, I don't think I waste time. I, I just think I choose to do things to nourish myself intellectually or spiritually. I can honestly say I don't think I waste time. I, I can't think of one thing I do that, does, that I would say is, you know, it's a waste of time. What was your favorite sports moment, either as a participant or as a fan? I mean, come on, I'm a Steeler fan. How, how is it that the, uh, the Immaculate Reception has to be my most... My, my where, most and where were you at the time? I was listening to it on the radio because it was blacked out in Pittsburgh. I remember my father when he came home from the game. He was the happiest I had ever seen him. And, you know, this is you to think about. The Steelers had been perennial losers for 40 years. Nothing ever went right. I mean, for goodness sake, they kicked a field goal to win the last game of the OJ sweepstakes and didn't get OJ. <laughs> right? And in that moment, everything changed for the city. And then the next week, Roberto Clemente died in a plane crash. And I remember never being so happy mostly because my dad was just over the moon and his you know, sisters and my grandfather and, everybody, and my, my mom, everybody, the whole city. But, but that was my world, right? And then everybody was like despondent five days later, six days later. And I don't think I'll ever get over that week, the good and the not so good. Uh, so those would be, you know, that would probably has to be my favorite moment. What advice would you give someone early in their career? Well, I have a 22-year-old son. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to be listening to you. But what uh, that's definitely you give true. His best friend? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, he, he uh, I got to give him credit. He, he listens. He'll argue with me, which is what he should be doing. But listen, I, I think the most important thing that you need to do during your 20s is recognize that it's really all about you. And, and it sounds selfish, but, it, it, but it's absolutely true. Up until the time you're 18, it's your parents really govern, for the most part, what you're in a, the, the, the box in which you're allowed to play. Some are a little tighter, some are a little wider, but it's your parents' box. And then you get to pick and choose which college you want to go to within a, a box, but it's still a box. And at that college, you, you kind of think that you have more, you, you're your own person, but the reality is you've got coursework and you've got like syllabuses and things you've got to do in, in order to graduate. So it's a box and you get to make decisions, but it's still, your parents are probably paying for you or you're working hard to get it done yourself, but it's a box. Then you turn 22 and boom. It's your life. And you can either look at that one of two ways. Oh my God, it's my life and I have no idea what I'm going to do. Or, oh my God, it's my life and I have no idea what I want to be. And my encouragement would be to choose the latter. It's not, it, it's not what you do that matters, per se, but who you are that matters. And in the first years of your career, you're exploring who you are as an adult. And it's the only time in your life when you can do that without attachment, where you don't have responsibilities for somebody else or a bunch of little somebody else's. And later it gets into your late 20s and early 30s, you're going to opt into that lifestyle. Most of you will. 
you know, some won't, but they'll make choices not to do that, right? But more likely than not, you're going to find a partner that you're going to want to share your life with. And the flip side of that is it's just less about you. It's now about the collective you. And if you haven't really done the work to understand what makes you happy, what makes you motivated, what gives you psychic joy in those early years, it's just harder to find that later on because it becomes about pleasing others again. So my advice is always find out who you are. Latch on to organizations that, that where you feel like you can make an impact in the, in the work that you're doing so that and figure out what you like about that first job and really importantly, what you don't like about it and write it down. Because chances are the things that you like and don't like about the places where you are are things that are going to be with you for the rest of your life. And so when you're looking at the next job opportunity, make sure that the next job opportunity is filled with many more things that you like and far fewer things that you don't like. And, you know, I'm sort of speaking to the 22 year old me when I say that, because I didn't think about that. And so here's the good news. Like, it's going to work out. (laughs) <laughs> right. Even if you don't do all that 50 year old advice stuff that you don't want to hear, uh, but you know, you probably should hear it because inherently you're human and humans, particularly intelligent humans, all humans really figure it out uh, in some way. Uh, and so, you know, but the advice I would give to 22 year olds starting out is, you know, do what you need to do and it's going to work out. What do you know now that you wish you knew 10 years ago? I know that I don't have to squeeze so hard. Sports people talk about this all the time. You know, you hear a, a, a baseball player when he's going through a slump, he's like, I'm just gripping the bat too tight. You know, hockey players talk about, I'm gripping the stick too tight. You're tight. I was tight coming into the financial crisis. I felt every trade was my responsibility Every winner was somebody else's and every loser was mine. And I loved Ramius so much that I almost choked it. And I had no objectivity. And it would have been great if I had taken a step back and said, you know, let me just let go a little bit. And we're surrounded by some really good people and give them a chance to breathe and listen to them. And if you've surrounded yourself with a really good team, which we had at Ramius at the time, and we still do, right, at Cowan, they will nourish you. They will give you oxygen in the moments where you most need it. And that's probably something I totally did not get, you know, in my late 30s. That I now look at what we've been able to accomplish here in a really tough environment over the last decade, and I'm thankful that I got the opportunity. I really am. I'm super thankful that my partners at Cowan, my, you know, my teammates embraced me because I'm not an obvious choice to do the things I'm doing. I came from a different place and uh, they believed in me and trusted me and I trusted them. And we were able to create uh, the framework for a firm that I think has tremendous runway. And I love that. And I just, and it's only because I've given them space to be the best that they can be and made it less about me. And that's just, a, I, that, that's what I would say is the thing I've learned right, one, most. One last question and we'll wrap up. Uh, it is your waning days. You are somewhere between 120 and 140 years old, <laughs> sitting in your rocking chair because that's what you do, taking that space. Uh, what advice would you give yourself today? Live more. Love more. Well said. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I, I just think that's what I would say. I enjoy it and don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Ted, you're an amazing person. I, you know, Sometimes we just end up having these conversations and uh, you, uh, you get me to really good places. So that's a very special thing about you. And I wish you all the luck with these. I think they're, they're amazing. So congrats to you and I wish you all the best. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. 
If you've liked what you've heard, please write a review on iTunes or Google Play to help others find out about the show. Have a good one and see you next time. Thank you.